Um, I've asked Nick if he would be willing to come and share his testimony this morning. So I'm going to turn this over and let Nick share with us what God has laid on his heart. Well, I was hoping no one would be here today, but apparently I did not have other plans. <laughs> so as most of you know, I was raised in a Christian home in Oregon. And kind of growing up, um, until the point I moved here, I didn't really think a lot of God, you know. I mean, I believed him and everything, but I didn't really take it all that seriously, and I didn't really think that much about it. And um, it was about a year after we moved here, we started doing discipleship in the other building with Pastor Glenn. And um, he was having us give our testimonies to each other. And I think Benj and possibly Dustin was, were there with me and Josh. Um, but we kind of wrote our testimonies out, we're giving them to each other. And I kind of got to thinking that night afterwards, um, do I really have a testimony? Because, you know, I had a hard time trying to fit a testimony into my life um, that I could actually think was true, you know. Because I had said little prayers and stuff when I was growing up, but I had never really taken it seriously, you know. Um, I just wanted to go to heaven and not to hell, pretty much. So, that night I got to thinking, you know, am I really saved? And I thought, well, I don't think I am. So, I kind of asked God in my heart, but the problem was, I was more doing it... Um, I was basically saying, I'll go where you want me to go, but let me drive, and um, you give the directions. And I wasn't really trying to follow him, I just wanted to follow him, I guess, a little bit more than I had before, hoping that I could get to heaven. And um, my life did get a little bit better, I didn't take life as quite as much of a big joke as I did before, um, and I thought more seriously of God and talked a little bit with people and stuff, um, and started praying. But it was about probably a year later, we were talking again at um, discipleship about testimonies. We didn't give ours that time, but we were still talking about it. And um, that night again, I was thinking, you know, do I really have a testimony? Because I knew that I hadn't fully committed to it um, the time a, a year or two before. So um, I decided, you know what, I can't just, you know, live not knowing. I have to know for sure. So I got saved that night. And um, it just felt totally different. It was just a relief and a peace that I'd never felt before. And um, it just changed my life so much. And after that, um, it was about six months later, you know, everything was good. I was like, okay, I got this, you know, made some plans and stuff. And God showed me that it wasn't through my own strength and everything kind of fell apart. And for a while, I was kind of like, I don't know, it was for a while, I was... I wasn't really bitter, I was just kind of like I didn't care about anything anymore, I didn't really care about other people, I didn't really care all that much about God. Um, and my brother talked to me a little bit, and you know, some friends talked to me a little bit, and you know, showed me that I had kind of just got to the point where I didn't really care anymore what happened. Um, so I kind of turned my life around a little bit, and started getting better and stuff, and um, God's still teaching me stuff. I know I still go through struggles and problems with things, but I know that he's faithful throughout the whole thing. And I know this is really short, but I'm going to end with a few verses. Um, the first one is Romans 10, 9. Everyone, um, never mind, that's the second one. Uh, if you believe in your heart Jesus is Lord and confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Amen. And the second one is Romans 10, 13. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Thanks. someone that real, doesn't realize they're dying. You know, when you go out into the water and someone's going under, they're kicking and flailing and they teach you the technique to, to try and save them, um, but ultimately you've got to watch out because 
their kicking and flailing can drag you under instead of you pulling them out. And one of the most difficult things to deal with in church is that the majority of people that are in church think they're okay. And they've learned all the words, they've learned the proper responses, they've learned when to stand up, when to sit down, what prayers to pray when, and they think they're okay. But none of those things bring salvation. None of them. You know, that's a gospel that is not a gospel. The only way to salvation is through Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, uh, 8, 9, and 10 tells us that we are saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves that anyone would boast. We have nothing to brag about in our salvation that, that we did anything. Because even the faith that we have, he gives us. He, he, he puts it into us. I mean, think about this. We're out wandering in the dark. God shines a light. We don't know the light. John chapter 1 tells us that. We don't recognize it. We don't understand what it is. And yet God shines a light and we go, Ah, no, it's bright, it hurts. And then God comes and he takes us by the hand and he leads us to that light. Okay? All he asks of us is to say, I believe. That's it. A couple weeks ago we talked about, you know, any other gospel. And how, as Christians, it's so easy to slip into this idea. We understand that come to the cross and receive salvation as a free gift. He's given it to us. Nothing that we could add to or take away from it. Okay? It's his to give to us. But then we kind of slip into this idea that now that we have salvation, we've got to work to keep it. And, you know, Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 says, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. And I think Paul is speaking specifically to this issue right there. We are free in Christ, right? We come to the cross and we are set free. But he didn't set us free to be burdened again as slaves. He didn't, you know, there's a story about that in the Old Testament where the Jews were taking their brothers and sisters and they were selling them into slavery and making them their slaves to pay off debts. And the prophet came and said, you, this is wrong. you got to set them free. And they went, you're right, we'll set them free. And a couple days later, when the lawn wasn't mowed and the dishes weren't washed, they started thinking, wait a minute. Who's going to do all my chores for me? And so they went out and they got their slaves and they brought them back and made them slaves again. That's not what God has called us to. He hasn't called us to freedom only to make us slaves again, to burden us with things that we could never do in the first place. That's why we can't come to salvation through the law. Okay? Through just obeying the law. We, we can't do it. We don't have the strength. We don't have the ability. So, we have been set free. Why were we set free? So that we could enjoy the freedom. Right? I mean, you, you aren't set free so you'd be miserable. I mean, isn't that kind of how people view Christianity? <laughs> can't sleep in on Sunday anymore. <laughs> I to give up going to the bar, hanging out with my buddies. You know, it's a, it's a list of do's and don'ts. Well, Nick just read what we do. What do we do? Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay? Believe. We confess and we believe. You know, I mean, there's a lot of people walking around, oh, I believe in Jesus. I'm good. I'm good. I mean, we got stories from Friday night that the the kids that went out and were doing evangelism. Everybody they talked to was saved. <laughs> Everybody's saved. Everybody's going to heaven. Oh, I'm spiritual. I'm good. I just I don't do church. You don't do church. You you're saved, but you don't. Oh yeah, and and I I I, I believe in heaven, but I don't believe in hell. So everybody's going to heaven? No, 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 no. There are some bad people out there. There are people that do bad things. Where do they go? I mean, do they get, like, sub-heaven? Or intermediary heaven? Or where do they go? And see, everybody has this idea, you know, we, we, we want a loving God. And He is a loving God. He is love. 
He is what defines love. Okay? And, and love is him. You can't separate the two. I, I had the opportunity yesterday to, to perform a wedding for, um, well, I, I, I say a girl. She's not a girl anymore. Um, she used to be a girl. That's how it works. You, you start off as a girl, then you become a woman. Um, but uh, someone that I'd known for, gosh, we're, we're coming up on 20 years. And I always like to talk about when I do wedding about how marriage is the perfect illustration of the relationship God desires from us. And we got to the point where we were doing the vows and I was struck by something. We don't have a flippin' idea what we're talking about. We don't. We have no clue. We, we, don't, we don't get it. When it says, for richer or poorer, in sickness or in health, for better or for worse, we go for health, for better, for help. Wait, what was it again? I missed it. Richer, yeah, richer. That's, that's a good one, we'll keep that one. It's funny, but where you have a divorce rate that exceeds 50%, some people put it up at 70%. And you know what's scary? It's exactly the same inside the church as it is outside the church. We don't have a clue. When we say, you are making a covenant not only with each other, but you are making a covenant before God. You are laying out your vows, and you are saying, this is what I am giving to you. Before God, this is what I'm giving to you. Fifty percent of marriages fail within seven years. Seven years. The majority of that fifty percent actually fails in the first three and a half years. Wow, what short-term memories we have, right? We 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 have no flipping idea what we're talking about. We we just have no clue. <coughs> Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, please. Now, if anyone here, I, I know I'm probably the only one that had a mom that said this, but just on the outside chance, did anybody else's mom say, watch your lips? Did anybody's mom say that, or am I the only one? Or watch what you say. Watch your. My mom always said, "Watch your lips," and I would always go, <coughs> and then I'd kind of black out after that. <laughs> There's a lot of my childhood I don't remember. <laughs> watch your lips. Watch what you say. Watch your mouth. Okay. Now, oftentimes we hear that because we've done something negatively. I have a, a brother that's 15 months older than I am, and when we were younger, we evidently we looked a lot alike. I can't figure it because he's ugly. <laughs> so I, I don't know what that says, but people would confuse us all the time. They thought we were twins. And I look at the pictures of when we were children, I think, what, are you blind? <laughs> My brother had the mouth of a sailor. Ooh, man, if he didn't know an appropriate cuss word, he would make one up on the spot. At seven. And I remember standing out at the baseball field. My oldest brother was playing baseball. My mom was the um, scorekeeper, and she was talking with the team mother. And the team mother was looking at us, and she was like, well, how do you tell them apart? Well, when I was little, I had hearing problems. They, they put it between 60 to 90% hearing problems, okay, hearing loss. It wasn't my ears, it was my brain. Go ahead and laugh, okay? Because somewhere between my ears and my brain, the signal would get scrambled and it just came into my brain as noise. That still happens today. That's why when I'm in a crowded room uh, with, with people and you're telling me something, I go, what was that? Okay, I, I gotta watch your lips. I gotta see what you're saying. Okay, so don't be offended if you say something and I just don't get it. Just tell me again. My family's learned that. You gotta tell me things. If, if I don't respond, 
It didn't happen. You, I am not responsible. Okay? You have to have an acknowledgement from me for this conversation to have ever taken place. All right? And so this, this team mother is looking back and forth. I remember her name was Miss Olson. And she's looking from my brother to me and to my brother to me. And she asked my mom, she says, how do you tell them apart? Mom said, oh, it's easy. This one's going to cuss you out and this one's not going to hear it. <laughs> See, we, we have this idea, watch your lips, is always this idea of something bad has taken place. But I want to tell you today, watch your lips. So, Matthew chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 33. Jesus is speaking to the crowd. This is the, the Sermon on the Mount. Um, one of the greatest all-embracing messages that we have in all of Scripture. I mean, he covers so much in this area that, quite honestly, I could work through this and never finish it in, in the career of my ministry. Okay? Verse 33. Again, you have heard it said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool. Or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. And some, some of your translations says from the evil one. Okay? Now, we have this idea, you know, we, for, for whatever reason in our culture... We have taken cussing, and we've called it swearing. And that's, that's entirely misappropriate, okay? Because when you swear something, you are swearing an oath. You are binding yourself, just like I was talking about at the wedding. They were laying out vows. They are saying, this is what I promise to you. Before God, this is what I say to you. Before God and these witnesses, this is what I promise to you. They swore an oath, okay? Now, Jesus is talking right here, and he says something kind of funny, because in the Old Testament, it was a given that you would swear an oath. You would say, I'm going to do this, and you would go, and you would sacrifice an animal to hold you to your oath. And there were laws that applied to how you could go about doing this and how you had to fulfill this. But Jesus is going beyond this. Remember, Jesus came not to abolish the law, but to what? To fulfill it, to make it complete. All right? So he's telling us the right way here. And he says, what power do you have by swearing that you can accomplish anything? What, you're, you're going to hold God to account by your swearing? Or, or, or nature? Or, or Jerusalem? Or, or, or better yet, you and your own power are going to hold yourself to this? Look, yes or no, that's all you need. That's all you need. Okay? Just let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Now, I don't know about you guys. Um, quite honestly, I hold Matthew responsible for this. But um, I've been in the Proverbs a lot. And, and Proverbs works really well because you can read one proverb a day and make it through in a month. Okay? And then the next month comes and you start all over again. Now, I, I, quite honestly, I love Proverbs and I hate Proverbs. Proverbs is perfect for me because they put it in simple black and white. Right? Does anybody else feel that way? Because sometimes I read some of this stuff and I go, well, that's nice, but what am I supposed to do? How, how do I apply this? Well, I like Proverbs. I'm going to read just a couple of them to you. All right? These are ones that God has been dealing with me about. All right? So, Proverbs 10, 19. When words are many, transgression is not lacking. But whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Proverbs 17, 28. Even a fool who keeps silence is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. <laughs> Let me translate for you. If you want them to think you're stupid, keep talking. Okay? 
Proverbs 29, 20. Do you see a man who is hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. And then Ecclesiastes. I'm just going to stick these two on. These are free. Uh, chapter 5, verses 2 and 5. Verse 2 says, Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. And then verse 5 says, It is better that you should not bow than that you should bow and not pay. Now, are you catching an idea here that God is kind of trying to lay out for us? Do you get the idea that he's trying to... What's God trying to tell us here? Shut up. You talk too much. When, when your mouth starts to flapping, sin comes in. Okay? Because our mouths move significantly faster than our brains. I know you guys never do this, but you, I hear things come out of my mouth that never enter to my brain. <laughs> and I go, <coughs> wow. And, and then I see the looks on the faces of the people around me, and I go back and I rethink, what did I just say? Ooh. Don't be hasty in your words. God tells us in Psalms, set a watch before my heart. Set a guard before the door of my mouth. Let nothing unclean come out from me. Okay? Scripture also tells us, where does our mouth speak from? Yeah. I hate that verse. Because when those things come out of my mouth, I have no one to blame but myself. Because they came from here. Okay? And so, when I hear something come out, and I see my wife and my children cringe, I don't get to blame that on the enemy. The devil didn't make me do it. I did out of maybe a moment of frustration, out of whatever. Basically, it's, it's sin, right? It's sin. Because God's already told me. You want to be smart? You want people to think you're smart? Shut up. Don't prove their idea that you're stupid by opening your mouth. Let them just assume it. Don't prove it. Okay? So, the power of words. Jesus says... We don't even need to take vows. God says throughout the Old Testament, watch your lips. James chapter 3, turn there with me if you would. We're going to read through a couple of passages here in James chapter 3. Now, uh, does anybody's Bible have a, a subheading for this chapter, right above chapter 3? <laughs> Taming the tongue. Is that what yours says? Yeah. yeah. All right. Here we go. <laughs> Starting in verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be subject to greater strictness, for we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to, bring, able to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of Pilate directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Now we're going to keep going here, but do you see what he's establishing here in the first part of this passage? He's giving us some ideas about the importance of what he's getting ready to say. All right? Now, if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man. I haven't met one yet. I haven't, haven't met one yet. Okay. <clears throat> he is able to bridle his whole body. 
He's able to control his whole body. And then he gives us some examples. I know we have horse people in here, horsemen and horsewomen. <coughs> Kathy, what's the bit for? To cause the horse to obey. Tell the horse what to do. There go. Yeah. Communicate. How big is it? Pretty small. Pretty small. Yeah. And there's all different kinds of bits. I mean, there's, there, there's some horses, they don't even need a bit. Mm -hmm. I wish I was one of those. <laughs> Not me. I need one of them big old things, a big old honky thingy in my mouth that, like, hurts. Because I'm, I'm stupid. And sometimes God tells me something, and I go, that's okay, I'll be with you in a minute. I'll be with you in a minute. And he goes, eek! <laughs> <laughs> that just shows the faithfulness of God. Okay? You ever been up close to a horse? I'll tell you a, a, a story. Um, we lived over in Victor in a trailer, and there was a pasture next to us, and then there was a pasture behind it, and there were two horses back <laughs> behind. Um, there was a, a black horse, and there was a red horse. And the owner of the property that we were living in, his brother came, they were his horses, and he asked me, he said, would you be willing to spring break my horse for me? I'd love to. I haven't got to ride a lot lately. I'd love to spring break your horse for you. Just warm him up, get him ready for the summer. So he brought over the saddle and the tack, and, and you know, I went out with the, the lead, and I walked out, and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, you know, um, the pony and the horse. And I walked up to the black horse, and that black horse is about 12 and a half hands high. I'm thinking, I thought you were a pony. And I looked at that big horse, and I could not get up onto the big horse without jumping. And all of a sudden, my confidence kind of went, <laughs> and I, I let him back. Oh, he was calm. So I was walking him back. Boy, I tried to put that bit in his mouth. He did not like that a bit. I got up on his back. I thought I was going to die. <laughs> I was hoping the rapper would come, bit buck. <laughs> so I was going to be ahead of all of you. <laughs> Whoosh, gone. It didn't, so you're OK. That horse was huge. And I had no concept of how big it was till I walked out and stood next to him. But you know what? When I got that bit in his mouth and I got him settled down, that horse would go wherever I led, wherever I directed. Okay? Look at the other example that he gives. Ships. They're big, driven by strong winds. And yet the rudder is small. Now, I don't know how many of you guys have ever been on ships. I'm not talking about the stuff down at Como. Those aren't ships, okay? Those, those are imposters. That's like calling a chihuahua a dog. <laughs> okay? It's just not the same, okay? Now, my dad was in the Navy. I got to go on uh, an aircraft carrier. I've been on a couple of different battleships. Those are ships, okay? And those things are huge. <clears throat> The turn radius of an aircraft carrier is miles. That's how big they are. And yet, the rudder is very, very small. And if you want to disable a ship, don't worry about punching holes in the armor. Get rid of the rudder. Because then they're stuck. And you got an easy target because they can't turn. Okay? Let's continue on with what he's saying here. So, verse 6. Well, let's, let's start in verse 5. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird or, or reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. 
Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. <coughs> Ouch. Ouch. Now see, out of the overflow of the mouth, the heart speaks. No, out of the overflow of the heart, okay, somebody help me. The heart. Overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Because if your mouth is, is pouring into your heart and your heart's speaking, you need to see a cardiologist. <laughs> okay? Or an audiologist, I'm not sure. <laughs> but we have a condition of our heart that is revealed by our mouth. Okay? Now, God has told us in his word that we have to control our thinking. You, you understand we have to control our thinking, right? We set our minds on things above, not on things below. We are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Why? Why do we need to be transformed? Come on, the passage says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may... Yeah, so you can know God's will. Which means that until your mind has been renewed, you don't know God's will. Okay, so we have to control our thoughts. Paul gives us very clear uh, steps how to do that in Philippians chapter 4. Think about these things, okay? That's where we set our minds. If we can set our minds, do you think we'd have an easier time controlling our mouth? Because see, here's the dilemma that we have. This is the dilemma that we face. When you come to Christ, he has taken out from you the heart of stone that you had before him. That heart that had no compassion in it, that was self-centered, <laughs> egocentric. Okay, I don't want, I'm not even saying just egotistical, but it was egocentric. As far as you were concerned, the world revolved around you. Okay? <clears throat> if you want to see egocentric, sorry guys, look at Annalisa. <laughs> She's cute. And she knows it. And she doesn't understand why she wouldn't get her way in anything. Because everything has been given to her. When she cries, she gets fed. When she cries, she gets hugged. When she cries, she gets a nap. When she cries, she gets poopies changed. <laughs> everything is based on satisfying her every need, right? We kind of live like that. We have this heart that tells us that everything should be revolving around us. Y'all need to get in gear and satisfy me. Okay, that's what our heart tells us. And when we come to Christ, God takes that out of us and he gives us a new heart of flesh and blood. But that's not all that he does. What does he do with that heart? He puts something on it. What's that? His name, but he also writes his commands on it. You understand that? That's why James is saying, don't, not many of you should presume to be teachers. I, I was in a church at one point that thought everybody should teach. There are just some people that can't teach. You, they're just not gifted with it. Okay? <clears throat> That's okay. Quite honestly, when my car is broken, I don't want the professor of physics up at the university coming down to fix my car. So I don't care why it should work the way that it should and it's not working. I don't care. I want you to take out the gizmo that's broken and replace it with a doohickey that'll make it work. That's all I want. And I want the man that is gifted to do that to be the one that works on my car. Okay? So don't presume to be teachers. Why? Because your mouth is going to get you in trouble. And you're going to be judged more strictly. Now, we're all judged on what we say, right? Let's turn back to Matthew. Chapter 12. We're going to start at verse 33. Now, 
this is kind of interesting because Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, to the religious people, the church. Okay? He's talking to the church. And he says, starting in verse 33, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Ouch! Ouch! Is anybody else saying ouch there? Ouch. Yeah. ouch! Now, if we left it right there, we're all in trouble. Because before the perfect righteousness of God, we've all messed up with what we've said. Right? We've all blown it. Nick, would you quote that first scripture for me again? If you believe in your heart, Jesus is Lord, and confess with your mouth that God raised you from the dead, you should be saved. Oh. Did you notice the connection there? Look, when we stand before God, if we have confessed with our mouth, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Out of the abundance of our heart, the mouth speaks, so we are believing that He is Lord. That means that we are putting Him as the final authority in our life. He's the one that gets the call. He makes the call. He says we do. Right? Okay? So if that is the case, that is the confession that we have before the Father. You see, if we end right here, for by your word you will be justified, and by your word you will be condemned. I want to be the one that's being justified. And the only way to be justified is to confess Jesus Christ is Lord. Okay? Because if that's not the case in your life, if you have not confessed Jesus Christ is Lord, then you're the next one. And by your words you will be condemned, because you have no covering. There is nothing to protect you from the perfect righteousness of God. Nothing. The only thing that can protect us from that is the blood of Jesus Christ. That's where we profess our mouth, the power of our mouth, the power of things that we say. Now, don't get me wrong. I know there's been a teaching out for years that was really strong back in the 80s and 90s, you know, the power of positive confession. I never got my Porsche. <laughs> and I professed that from the time I was 14 till all of a sudden God told me, no, you're not going to get one. What do you mean no? I just got to say it often enough. That's what they tell me. I'm not talking about that garbage. We do not manipulate God. Okay? That, that's called putting God to the test. Right? Saying, okay, God, you got to do this. you got to behave in a manner that I expect. That's not what he says. That's not what he's giving us. He's giving us better. Right? He's giving us better. I don't need a Porsche. Quite honestly, I don't need a car. Do you understand that? What do I need? I need a way to get from here to there. So God bless me with whatever is going to get me from here to there. But please, not that big red horse. <laughs> <laughs> but not my will, but your will. If there's a big red horse waiting in my front yard when I get home, I'm going to laugh. <laughs> I don't jump as well as I used to. <laughs> See, God has given us authority. Okay? But it's not just authority for good. We can also use it as things for bad. Have you ever spoken something and watched a child's face just crumple? And then your heart crumples because you realize what an idiot you are? Hmm. Okay? In this marriage... I listened to them giving their vows. And I was just struck. Uh, that's the third wedding I performed. Third. Odds are, at least one of those three is going to end in divorce. That's, that's what simple statistics tells us. Okay? We're getting ready to do another wedding here in two weeks. 
You guys can't be one of the statistics. You're not allowed. If, if you're going to be one of the statistics, I'm not doing your wedding. If they are, there'll be another statistic. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll preach on that next week. <laughs> I've got my keynote for their message. <laughs> We have to understand what we say. Okay, look, if we are confessing that we believe that God can do things in our life, that God can change the situation, God can change the circumstance, God can move, say it believing. Say it with the understanding that we are subject to God's will. And his will for us is what? Good. His heart towards us is good. Even in the garbage we go through in this life, God's will for us is good. He wants, why, does, why, do, why do we go through hardship? Did God lose control? Did God fall asleep? Did, did God wander off to go take care of somebody else's problem? No. no. So what, what, what happened? Why are we going through hardship? What does James 1 tell us? Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Why? So that you may develop perseverance. What does Peter tell us? He says, why are you acting surprised that such a thing has come upon you? Don't you know that this happened so that your faith may be tried and found as pure gold? Don't you understand that God is refining you? He's putting you through the fire so all the yuck will be burned off. That's why. Watch your lips, watch your lips, watch your lips. Because out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth is going to speak. Okay? Start working on controlling this thing up here, the gray matter that fills out your noggin. Okay? Put it to better use than just keeping your head swollen. All right? Put it to better use. Pray every day. God set a guard before my mouth that nothing unclean would come forth from it. <clears throat> Why? So that people look at me and go, wow, he's just such a nice person. He never says anything mean. No, quite honestly, I don't care if anybody ever looks at me and says that. I don't care. Matter of fact, my hope is nobody ever does. I hope that when people look at me, they see that God is in me, that God is changing me. That I have a testimony by the way I live my life and the things that come out of my mouth that tell people that there is a God that I serve that is above and beyond myself. Okay? Because when I get before him, I don't want him looking at the list and going, wow, I see you had 346 followers, but only six of them made it into heaven. But only six of them were my followers. I want to bring the entire flock that he's giving me care of right back to him. The entire flock. Watch your lips. You want to be thought intelligent? Quit talking. Quit talking. You want to hear God? Quit talking. All too often in our prayer time, we talk, 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 talk. And we never give God an opportunity. And then I, I hear people say, well, I just don't hear God. I don't hear from God. <clears throat> Do you ever listen? Do you ever quit talking long enough to listen? To hear what he would say to you? <clears throat> Let's get a flipping idea about the words that come out of our mouth. Let's let our yes be yes and our no be no. Let's let other people think we are really, really intelligent. That we are wise. Let's honor God with the things that usher forth out of our hearts. <clears throat> Amen? Amen. Father, we bless you today. I thank you, Father, that as you've given us direction, <coughs> you have not given it to us that we can accomplish it in our own abilities, in our own power. But, Father, your word says us that you have filled us, you have sealed us with your Holy Spirit. Father, that you have given us everything, everything that we need as pertains to life and godliness. You've already given it to us.
We thank you, Father, that the strength is yours, the ability is yours, the endurance is yours, and you give it to us in due season as needed. I ask, Father, that you would help me to control my lips, to control my thoughts. Father, that my heart would be right before you, and that out of that would usher praise and honor and glory, things that would bring those to you, Father, that would honor you. Help us, Father, to be a people that bring you praise, that make you pleased. We bless you today, Father, and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.